Hi, I'm Alyssa Alcorn and I'm a final year PhD student in the University of Edinburgh School of Informatics, where I'm based in the Institute for Language, Cognition and Computation. My own work focuses on technology for young children, specifically young children on the autism spectrum. While a lot of the time I'm alone in my office, I do need to get out of the office and talk to people in order to do my best work. I'm not a young child or a parent or a teacher, so I need to talk to these people in order to understand what they value and what they need and make technology then that can help meet those needs. When I first started working in this area, I joined a large autism and technology project that was using participatory design, or PD. I had never heard of participatory design before and I had no idea what it was about. I hope this video will help to answer some of the questions that I first had when I first found out about PD and was trying to understand it. This video will address the following questions. First, what is participatory design? How could we define it and where did it come from? Second, why is it that we might want to use participatory design and what could we hope to learn from it? Finally, what are some of the challenges and difficulties of using PD? So what is participatory design? Well, we already know a bit about design and the design process. Hopefully the double diamond here with the four phases looks familiar. And participatory design is still design as we know it, going through these phases and dealing with the same kind of issues. However, now we're going to be involving different people in the design process. We're going to have more people participating as a part of our design team, either all the way through the project or only at certain points. Let's look at a definition of PD. This is a fairly widely cited definition that says that in PD, the people destined to use the system play a critical role in designing it. Now, we might not be making a system it might be a service, an object, a website. There's lots of things that we could design, but the idea remains the same. That whoever is going to need to engage with whatever our final output is should be able to be involved in the design process in a meaningful way. Nowadays, we often talk more about stakeholders than we do about users. Stakeholders is a broader term that includes users but also includes anyone else who has a stake or an interest in the design process. For example, if we were designing a public health program, we might have doctors and nurses and nutritionists as some of our stakeholders, even if the program is not actually targeted at them. So why this idea of people who are users or stakeholders having a say in the design process? This idea came out of Scandinavia in the 1970s and 1980s and originally started in workplaces rather than a research context. And the main idea was to be bringing employees into workplace decision making. The main goal of this was about democratizing the workplace. There was also the idea of employees as experts. They were the ones who knew their work best and often already had ideas about what was needed or how to improve it. So really drawing on workers as experts as part of the design process. This is really a very political view of design and really thinking much more about design as change. And even now in the Scandinavian tradition, there's much more of a focus about change and development of people or organizations or practices rather than just having specific outputs. Um, so this is really talking about design very, very much in terms of values, rather than talking about originating a specific method. Today, the motivation for many PD projects is less political. Instead, the project might be justified by talking about how stakeholder involvement helps us create more relevant designs, or more feasible designs that are better meeting people's needs. However, this idea of stakeholders as experts remains as important as ever in modern PD. So when and how are people going to participate? Stakeholders may play different roles in different design phases in different projects. Often stakeholders will just be involved during one of our design phases down there in the double diamond. 
or it's possible that we might be going back to the same individual stakeholder or group of stakeholders throughout the process, like a focus group or an advisory group. However, it's possible but rare to have stakeholders join the design or research team as co-designers and have them fully involved in the entire process, starting from the very initial explorations around what the project's going to do all the way through to delivering a final output. Now, it's rare to have this level of high involvement as a full member of the team, partly because it can be logistically very, very difficult. It's a really, really big time commitment and energy commitment from both the researchers and the stakeholders in order to make this work. However, when it does work, it's considered very, very valuable for the depth of the insight that it can bring to the design process. So talking about different roles and different levels of participation can be quite abstract, and it would probably help to have an example. So let's look at a couple of different forms of participation in a project from my own research area, which was the ECHOES project, creating a virtual environment for children with autism. Early on in the project, still kind of exploring the problem space and what the technology might be like and what it might do, there were a number of activities with children on the autism spectrum, trying to explore their ideas around play and fantasy and magic and that kind of thing that would help shape the behavior of the technology. So here's a few examples from a drawing activity that asks them to add things to a magic garden location to make it a fun place to play. Later on in the development phase, ECHOES involved an advisory group of special education teachers to help reflect on the emerging technology and shape it to better meet the needs of children. Here in this picture, the staff members are doing a combination of storyboarding and role play to explore how specific children they knew at the school might interact with the technology and how it could support them. They were using paper cutouts both to kind of act out the ideas and document the ideas. So here's a close up of one of their storyboards. We also involved children at a number of points in the design process. And this was really important to find out how children were making sense of the technology. So they tested multiple versions throughout the development phase. And for some children with better language skills, they participated in what was really a design critique session. They were discussing the technology with a researcher in a critical, reflective way as they were using it, talking about things that they liked or didn't like, what made sense to them or not, suggesting other ways that the things in the environment could behave. For more on PD and why we might want to use it in a project, I spoke to Professor Helen Payne, Chair of Interactive Learning Environments at the University of Edinburgh and an experienced PD researcher. If you are a stakeholder in a design process, if you are going to be an end user, shouldn't you have a say in what's actually being designed? If we take into account the viewpoints, then particularly if we include our participants as full design partners, the likelihood of the success our design is going to be increased. You know, as an individual designer, we may think we know what's actually required, what our design should, how it should unfold. But actually, that's just our single perspective, and it's our perspective as a designer. Professor Payne has given us quite a lot to think about there, so let's unpack that a bit. She mentioned several reasons, all one after another. The first one, talking about shouldn't people have a say in what's being designed, is really referring back to that earlier idea of democratization and involving people in decision making. Um, this, is, this is the idea of making an argument that people have a right to participate in the design process if they're going to use whatever the final product is. Helen also talked a bit about perspective. We'll come back to that in a moment. She also mentioned increasing the success of our design, which sounds like a good idea, but it might not be clear exactly what that means. First, the idea of perspective. Well, this also goes back to some of those original ideas and reasons for participatory design, which is the idea of stakeholders as experts. 
stakeholders have knowledge that we as designers or researchers do not have. Often the designers or researchers will be very, very different than whatever the groups of stakeholders are. Their understanding of their current context that they're in and their current practices might also be different than what the designers and researchers understand. It's important to keep in mind that designers and researchers can really only work from where it is that we are or who we are. And no matter how much experience we might have, professionally or life experience, we really are only working from our own viewpoint. And that is why it is so important to involve others when we are designing uh, objects or systems or services that other people are going to be the ones using. We need to hear from them. This brings us neatly to the idea of successful design. When we work with stakeholders, we're improving the knowledge that we're feeding into the design process. And this could be at any stage. This could be our initial understanding of the problem area and the possibilities and what's happening now. It might be at the very end in terms of how do we package up and deliver whatever we've made and how do we explain it to people. We're more likely to do that well if we're getting input from stakeholders and troubleshooting with stakeholders all the way along. It can also sometimes be very important for stakeholders to have this sense of ownership about having been involved in the design process. And for many, many different types of design projects, this kind of buy-in can be enormously important to the final success of the project. So really, overall, when we're involving stakeholders and really truly listening to what they have to say and what they know, we're much more likely to have designs that are meeting the stakeholders' needs, designs that are usable, designs that are feasible, and designs that, that make sense and have meaning in whatever the context is where they're really going to be used. Participatory design has many possible benefits, no matter what it is that we're designing. Whether or not we make an argument that stakeholders have a right to be involved in the design process, using PD can help us ensure that our final outputs are reflecting people's needs, values, and experiences. So, why don't all researchers or designers use PD for everything? Well, in many cases, doing PD can be too difficult. PD can be complex and time-consuming, and there simply may not be enough time, money, or expertise to involve stakeholders in a meaningful way. On the other hand, some designers or projects may take a completely different view of how the design process works. There, the designer is the one who knows best, and stakeholders are really only end users seeing the finished product. For now, let's say we do want to use PD in a project. What are some of the challenges that we might face? So one of the challenges in the design process is how do we accommodate the differing desires, needs, and requirements of the different stakeholders involved? How do we balance that? And how do we make sure everybody gets some say, even if not necessarily an equal say? When contributing to the design process, it isn't the case that everything that is generated, discussed, designed will necessarily appear, appear in the final artefact. And not only do we have to find ways to make decisions on this, we also have to make sure participants and stakeholders are aware that this is the case. Aside from the logistical difficulties and the level of commitment that's required for any kind of participatory design, Having a big diversity of input and views and values is probably going to be the biggest challenge. Stakeholders may disagree strongly with each other and with designers. In a way, PD is actually particularly well equipped to deal with these differences of opinion and values because it acknowledges that they're going to exist and even sometimes treats them as positive especially in the original Scandinavian tradition, they see conflict as being a way to drive new ideas and generate new possibilities. The design team needs to innovate in order to be able to overcome those problems. So even when we have participants involved, it is up to the designers or the designers and the stakeholder design partners to kind of be processing these conflicting inputs 
and trying to create something that's workable and meaningful in that context. We may not end up with all of the stakeholders having an equal voice, but we do need to try to end up with a design that's meeting as many needs as possible and is something where people will look at it and see their input reflected and valued in some way. Other challenges in participatory design have to do with the design process itself. Many stakeholders will probably never have been involved in a design process before. They might find it a bit strange and also a bit ambiguous. This might be quite different than things that they've done before. So managing stakeholder expectations about what's actually going to happen is a really important part of the process. As Helen mentioned, uh, it's important to be clear that not all ideas are going to make it into the finished product. We may also need to take specific actions to support participation and make it manageable and make it make sense. This might be changing our instructions or adjusting the level of commitment we need. It might also need changing our activities. If we're going to work with children, we're probably going to need different activities and different kind of instructions than if we're working with adults. The major challenge of the design process, though, is really about building up these respectful working relationships and being open to what it is that stakeholders have to tell us, even when what they have to tell us is that they have no idea what we're talking about and don't think they would ever use whatever it is that we're proposing. It can be really difficult to build these relationships. Um, there may be a certain amount of mistrust between designers and stakeholders, and sometimes you may even have the opposite problem where stakeholders are overly deferential to the researchers and designers and keep saying, well, you're the expert, you tell me, uh, and have difficulty seeing their own knowledge or their own expertise as valuable and thus are reluctant to share what it is that they know. I hope that you're now starting to have an idea of what participatory design is all about and some of its benefits and challenges. Do keep in mind though that this video has tried to give short answers to some very complicated questions. There's a lot more information out there about PD and how to use it. Thank you.